All right. You are watching Tax Tuesday or listening to Tax Tuesday or somehow taking in Tax Tuesday. This is Toby Mathis. And Jeff Webb. And we're here to bring tax knowledge to the masses. And boy, there's a lot of tax lack of knowledge going around out there right now, our politicians. Um, Jeff, I didn't even finish your beard. I'm just going to give you a little Fu Manchu here. I don't know if you're allowed to say that anymore. I'm going to give you a little facial hair. That eh, is pretty close. You look better in person. All right, Tax Tuesday rules. Let's jump in. We've got a lot to go over. First off, you can ask your questions live. Uh, I ask that you do that in the tax and answer area because we have accountants and tax professionals standing by to answer them. So we have Elliot Thomas, Dana Cummings, Tavia Harder. I don't know if Pio is here, but uh, but we'll get there. Is Pio there? Patty, you tell me. Yes. Oh, yes, he, he is. is. Oh my gosh. So we have like tax attorneys, accountants, bookkeepers galore. So you can ask your questions, ask it in the uh, question and answer area. You can also, uh, if you have technical issues or if you're responding to me, if I'm having a conversation with you, or if you just have spontaneous questions, throw them up. Like if something we're covering and you want clarifying questions, use chat. So if you have a question about you, use the question and answer. If you have questions about the subject that we're on, uh, by all means, uh, ask it in chat. Oh, Christos is on too. He's so yep. quiet. He just sneaks by. You guys got some horsepower on today. So we're like ready to rock it. And so I already see that they're answering some questions. I probably won't even get to see it. Uh, just as a side today, could everybody let me know where they're from uh, in chat? Just put what city and state you're in, or if you just want to pick a city or just a state. I always like looking at it. So Anchorage, Long Beach, Miami, Florida, Florida, Tucson, Arizona, Colorado, Ashburn, Virginia, Titusville, Florida, Oregon, Texas, San Jose, California, Scottsdale, Minnesota, San Bruno, uh, Kapolei, Seattle, Snellville, Sacramento, Oregon, McMinnville, New York, Maui, gosh, we got flying through here, Las Vegas, Middletown, Prescott, Fairfax, Virginia, Los Angeles, San Francisco, Burien, Washington. I went to Kennedy High School, Kai, so I was right there with you. Kansas, uh, Evans, Wenatchee, somebody's over there in Wenatchee, it's a beautiful town. Chicago, so we have people from all over the country. There's an Orlando, Evans, Kansas, Honolulu. I wish we were in Honolulu. We should start to Palm Desert. California, beautiful place. I used to live there. I used to have a place in Palm Desert for about 20 years. Clint and I did, which meant Clint had a place in <laughs> Palm Desert. Because I was like, I already live in a desert. Why am I going to go there? Um, Hanukkah. Oh, I can. How do you say that? Hanukkah. -e. There we go. Hanukkah. -e. And New Jersey. I can show you how much of a, uh, what would they call you in Hawaii? Uh, uh, I'm not going to say it because it would probably <laughs> yeah. get me in trouble now. <laughs> South Dartmouth, Brooklyn, New York. We got people from all over the place. St. Paul, uh, I think that's Minnesota, but it says Missouri. Music City, USA. So we got people from all over. I just never really asked that on, on the uh, Tax Tuesdays. And here, guys, Wisconsin. Uh, we do this every other Tuesday. You can invite your friends, ask any questions they want. It's tax season. Uh, we'll throw in there a little bit of tax policy tonight because we have some going on that's out there in the press. And I like to clarify certain things that get misstated, you know, and we like to, you know, make sure that everybody knows as much as humanly possible so you can make independent decisions. Manteca, Baytown, Los Angeles, Ruby. We got people from just all over the place. We're so lucky. We are. Yeah. And it's so, oh, New Orleans. New Orleans, Louisiana. My brother lives in Slidell. So Wayne, right across the bridge from me. New Orleans is another garden district. It's gorgeous. And I like Blue Dog. All right. Uh, we say it's fast, fun, and educational. It's meant to, to give back and educate. We don't charge a dime for answering questions. If you get real specific, we might ask that you become a client so we can dig into things for you. Our packages are really inexpensive. You can become a uh, platinum member, for example. As low as $35 a month, we can answer your questions in writing. You can talk to attorneys and our advisors 
ad nauseum if you want to, but we can answer your tax questions in writing or you can become a full-fledged tax client. That's not why we do this. We do this just to spread out information. We have accountants on here, CPAs. We love to share. A lot of times I get stumped. Uh, every now and again, Jeff gets stumped and somebody comes to our rescue that's out there and says, by the way, I'm looking at it right now, guys, here's the site. So uh, we make sure like, it's a good community. So we learn as much from uh, as, as you guys. I was thinking about that today as uh, we grab the questions. We get about 400 questions a week and we grab uh, 10, 15 and uh, answer them live. And I'm looking at it going, boy, it's making me dig into things that I might not otherwise dig into. And so uh, it helps me out too. I don't know if it right. helps you out. No, absolutely. Jeff's been doing this a little longer than me. He's like, ah, I got this stuff. Then we just go through them live. So here's the questions we're gonna be answering today. When you have a PLLC, how do you know what goes on a personal or business card? Uh, we'll answer that, assuming that it's a credit card or a, I don't think it means like a business, like a business <laughs> card, business card. I was thinking about that. Business card, personal card. Um, how do I go about transferring stock options to a 501c3 before selling to avoid capital gains? Somebody out there has been paying attention. Uh, how do you claim the solar credit on your personal residence? I think we answered that a few weeks back too, but hey, sometimes it comes up. Um, should I file a return with my kids as dependents or should they file their own return if they are paid from a family business? We'll go through all these. I'm remodeling two bedrooms to turn my home into a rental. Can I count the remodeling as tax write-off? But they're doing bathrooms. They're doing bathrooms. We call them bedrooms. Oh, did I say bedrooms? Bathrooms. It shows you. It's out there in the ether. <laughs> How does one, I should look down and actually read it from here, but I like reading out in the distance. Uh, how does one pay into a 401k from an LLC? If I bought an investment property under my name, when could I transfer it into an LLC without the bank pulling my note on the house? Which way should you report rental income as a business or as an individual owning the property? We'll answer all of these. What is a reasonable age to start paying your child for work and open a Roth IRA for? Mm -hmm. These are really good questions. So you're gonna get your money's worth today. It's free, right? I have a rental property in California. When I go there to work on it, can I use per diem plus mileage rather than actual receipts for housing and meals? We'll dissect that for you. Um, can you describe S corporation, non-taxable distributions or dividends? Absolutely. I haven't done taxes for 2020. And I'd like to know how to write off bills for my emotional support animal. And very common nowadays, uh, can that be to get, uh, done together with business taxes? And so we'll dive into that. There's actually some specific rules on that. That's very interesting. Uh, some of you guys are writing up there. Uh, da, 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 da. We'll talk to you. There's oh, some people have gotten the book from Amazon. So if you guys didn't know, we have uh, Infinity Investing came out today and uh, it's already number one on personal finance on Amazon. Thank you. And uh, we're gonna be spreading that word out. You know, we sit there and we, we look at tax returns for decades. We've been looking at tax returns and there's so many people out there full of so much poop and they tell you that they're making money and they're not really making money. And then there's the people that never tell you that they're making money and they're actually making lots of money and they tend to do it all in the same ways. And so we're gonna talk about that. Now, before we get into that, we're gonna talk about our, uh, what's going on right now uh, in politics. No, we're not gonna talk politics. We're gonna talk about the proposal to increase uh, certain types of tax. We've talked about it before, and this is apolitical. I don't care about what side of the aisle you're on. But what we want is to make sure that you have the most clear view of what these proposals mean. And quite often politicians, they may be getting pushed in a direction from their party and may be getting misinformed. And so I always look at it and say, if your intention is to do X, what's the most efficient way to get, to get there? And one of the things that they're talking about is this increase in corporate taxation. Now I happen to be a believer in less is more that when we lower the corporate tax rate, we tend to do a little bit better. And I think that worked its way out. There was a business round table that, that came to that same conclusion. Uh, before this pandemic, our unemployment was at its lowest rate in 50 years. So I, I tend to think, why are we going back and messing this up? But just for clarity, when they say they want to increase taxation on businesses to make them pay their fair share, 
keep in mind that businesses in the last umpteen years, they pay a, less than 8% of the total taxes in this country, less than 8%. It's a minuscule amount. We're talking about a drop in the bucket. And even if you were to increase this, let's say you were to double it and somehow the businesses all went along and said, you know what, we're gonna pay twice as much tax. You've increased your taxes by about 8%. Who pays taxes? We do, employees do, right? People that pay um, the self-employment tax, the old age uh, disability hospital insurance, mm -hmm. survivors benefits, Medicare, that's actually 33% of the taxes collected, mm -hmm. about 55% is individual income taxes. So between those two things, you're talking about a huge amount. And if you wanted to adjust it, I'm all for it, go for those like over that $400,000 hump, I could see that, but I don't know why they're picking on the, the companies. And here's the biggest reason. This was uh, just a something from the Center of Public Integrity, not a far right, maybe could be closer to a left. But what is absolutely reality is that when you pack in a corporate tax, it is one of the few items that a utility gets to pass on to its customers. And I want that to sink in for, for a second. The customers pay the tax. So if they increase the corporate tax rate, what happens to all of the, 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 the least wealthy amongst us? And there's been studies that show that this pandemic hit the poor much harder than the rich. What is it gonna do to the poorest among us tax bills or our utility bills? It's gonna increase it. Just like when they lowered the corporate tax rate, it led to lower rates amongst the, the, the uh, consumers. And it's not huge, it's like five bucks a month. I think it was in speaking of somebody said they're from New Orleans. So I was, I was thinking about New Orleans. I know that number was $4 and 10 cents a month is what the average utility bill was decreased. So it's not massive amounts, it's 50 bucks a year, but who does 50 bucks a year matter to? Yeah, and somebody says that maybe so, but but so many of the largest pay zero in tax. That's because when you make their when there's such a disincentive to report your taxes in the United States, mm -hmm. like like there's such a punitive tax bill, which we were the highest amongst all industrial countries, and we would be back there again if we jumped up to 28%, just to give you an idea. That gives the Amazons, the Apples, and all these companies of the world the idea to go someplace else where they don't pay that tax. You have to make it to where, hey, you know what? It's not worth it for you to go through all that mess. Why don't you stay here and work, you know, and pay a little bit of tax so you don't have to go do all this maneuvering? Because there is that the higher it goes, the more incentive you're giving to somebody to find ways to defeat it. And so I always kind of look at it and say, look, why, why, why are we goofing around with things when I don't believe it's actually going to do what you intend? The uh, increase in the self-employment tax and the uh, in FICA, Social Security. All of those increases over a $400,000 mark, I get it, absolutely. If you want to increase the highest tax bracket, I get it, but I don't understand why you're going after a business that doesn't, you know, really corporations don't pay their own taxes. All you're doing is hitting the workers. And they have showed that, that for every dollar of tax decrease, there's about $2 of extra employment. And so I just look at that going, gosh, are we really fit figuring this? And again, I just say for mine food, uh, be a little bit of a skeptic on it. By all means, don't listen to me and say what he said, you know, go out there and actually research it yourself and take a look. But uh, that's just, just another idea because you're not hearing too much about that. And I just look at it and say, is there a way that it could hammer the people that could least afford it? Absolutely. What's going on? With, oh, and by the way, one of the reasons why the utilities, why this is like the by, why the bills didn't lower further is because when they lowered the, the corporate tax rate, they took away utilities ability to use bonus depreciation. If they increase in that, that meant that not as much tax savings went to the consumers because they weren't able to write off all their equipment and everything fast. So there weren't, uh, it wasn't as big a tax break. So even though people's utility bills went down a little bit, it wasn't as big as it could have been. But if they increase it, are they going to readjust that and allow bonus depreciation amongst the utilities? And that's a big no right now, which means ta that the, it could actually go up much more than what we saw as a decrease uh, after 2017. So anyway, 
Um, there we go. Make sure. All right. Enough of that nonsense. Um, you guys get to research and make your own opinions. Uh, and that's, that's beautiful, the American way. But I just want to make sure that we're considering all angles. Uh, just because sometimes we think we're doing something that's going to affect the rich. Trust me, the rich have really, really good accountants and lawyers. And if there's a way to defeat something, they will find it. And so you need to be a little bit tighter. I'd be, I'd be looking at more on the consumption side. Let's just put it that way. All right, let's go and dive into this. When you have a PLLC, how do you know what goes on a personal or business card? Uh, this not only applies to PLLCs, but any business. Um, if you have a business uh, credit card, that's great. But I know a lot of the credit card companies aren't willing to issue to new small businesses. Uh, mm -hmm. So you use a personal credit card. Uh, my preference is you use that personal credit card only for that business. It makes it cleaner. That way you deduct everything that's on there. You deduct the interest, if should there be any, if you're not paying it off monthly. Uh, but yeah, it's pretty straightforward. Um, if once you have start having some mixed use on a personal card, you're paying some expenses personally, mm -hmm. it, it gets very confusing. Uh, the interest calculations get crazy, uh, but uh, you, you just want to be able to separate those expenses between personal and business. And, and let's get kind of technical technical on this. When you see PLLC, that just means a limited liability company and that P stands for professional and not all states have a PLLC. So just substitute PLLC for LLC if it makes you feel better. I'll even just write it up there. It just means it's a professional. So it could be a lawyer, engineer, mm -hmm. doctor's office. It just depends on the state. And an LLC is not a tax vehicle. So an LLC does, isn't a tax form. For example, it could be a partnership, it could be a sole proprietorship, it could be an S corp, it could be a C corp for tax purposes. But that LLC just means the entity in which the business is held. And so then the big question is, should I be writing any personal expenses, groceries, my personal utilities, my personal expenses? And would I, should I be writing them on a, on a business card? And the answer is no, anything that's personal needs to stay with you. Even if you incur personal expenses that are for the benefit of an employer, like, for example, if I have a, uh, a home office, if I have an administrative office in my home, it's even better. Um, and the company is going to reimburse you for that usage. You should still be paying that in individually and then reimburse and then reimburse. Somebody asks, is a limited the same as an LLC? Kind of. Yeah, it's still just a state entity. And then we're going to choose how it's going to be taxed. So an LTD might be the same as a corporation in some states. It might be treated as an LLC and you pick its tax, but similar concept. When you're using a business card, you're going to, you're, you're using it for what are called section 162 expenses for the most part, which is ordinary and necessary business expenses. So it's something that you in, use in your business to derive a profit. So you're trying to use it so you can generate new customers, you're using it for your services, you're using it for things that are related to that business for the express purpose of operating that business with the intent to make some sort of profit. And uh, once you start doing that, then you realize, hey, the things that go on that business card should only be things that relate directly to that business. If you are in that, like, should I be paying for these groceries crowd? That goes personal. Like if in doubt, buy it personally and reimburse yourself rather than uh, using the business card. It's not like it's, your company's gonna blow up, but if you're buying a whole bunch of personal expenses and you're mixing them, that's called alter ego. And the, the easiest way to explain that is the amount of respect you show your business is the amount of respect the IRS or a court will likely show your business. And if you're using a business card, and you're paying for your kids' soccer, you know, soccer shoes or lessons or whatever. And you're, when you're going and buying groceries, and you know, you're taking your spouse out to dinner that has nothing to do with business, and you're just constantly using it for that, expect that the IRS or the courts aren't going to give you a great deal of respect and may treat the business as you. And that's what you want to be careful to, you know, to not allow. Yeah, I find that to be a really slippery slope. That oh, like just this one time, I need to use yeah. my business card. And 
then it happens again. And then, oh, I'm going to pay it back. And it never happens. And if in doubt, use your personal. Use your personal card. And then we'll, and we'll do a reimbursement. Uh, but um, try not to use your business for like, oh, this one time I'll use it to buy, you know, God knows I've seen enough stuff that goes on there. I'm like, what the heck is that? You know, they're buying a bunch of booze or something. I'm like, well, I didn't have any space on my card. I'm like, <laughs> yeah, all right. Uh, somebody wrote about the previous issue that utility rates in Northern California and Eastern Texas went up. Yep. They took away certain aspects of deductibility and, 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 and gave a tax break on some. So they offset in some, some places, the cost of energy still is increasing. It's, it's always going up. In fact, if you looked at it, it's on a continuous chain upward, right? Energy prices have not come down. Uh, it's just, if all things being equal, it, it, re, it ended up in a small reduction over, over the period of time after they, uh, after they lowered the taxes. Because like utilities are a monopoly and they're heavily regulated. And there's only certain things they can pass on to customers. Because could you imagine if they said, hey, we're gonna pass on our, our outside business endeavors to the customers as an expense. Well, they're a monopoly. You got nothing else to do. It's like they could just start tacking in all their investments. They're not allowed to do that as a result. Mm -hmm. So uh, what, what gets kind of funny is uh, some of these companies were putting aside, like they, they were charging their customers for the tax, but then they would do outside ventures that were creating losses. And so they didn't actually owe the tax, but they had collected it. So there was these millions and millions of dollars sitting in some of these utilities on their balance sheets. And everybody's going like, hmm. And they're like, but we're owed the tax on it, but we got a big deduction over here. And if you know, Jeff and I like to, to play around in the tax world. Real estate's a great example. You could go very little out of pocket and create a big loss. Eventually you got to pay it, right? So there was a bunch of that stuff that went on. If you're a tax geek, you can dive into that stuff. If you're not, you'll be happier. <laughs> Just go about life and smile a little bit and say, hey, it's not as easy as what they're saying. Uh, all right. How do I go about transferring stock options into a 501c3 before selling to avoid all capital gains? Jeff, could you tell them, like, what are they looking at here? Why would they do this? Uh, when I first looked at this question, I didn't realize they were talking about stock options. Uh, I'm not sure that you would want to transfer stock options into a, a 501c3, but let, let's just say that they're stocks, they're securities. Uh, the main reason you want to do this is you want to do it with appreciated stocks. Um, you don't pay any tax on the gains. Say you bought it for $100 and now it's worth $10,000. Mm -hmm. uh, you don't have to cash those in. And, and we've seen it where clients have cashed in a lot of stock and then tried to transfer it to a nonprofit. And it's cost them greatly. Uh, so what Jeff is talking about is let's say that you have a company, ABC. And I'm going to put FMV, which stands for fair market value. That's what its value is today. So let's say it's worth a hundred bucks. What a lot of people are tempted to do is to sell it and they sell. And so they have $100 that comes in, they subtract off their basis. So they have $90 of gain versus if this has been held for over a year, you could take that. $100 stock and give it to charity. In which case you have zero gain, but you have a $100 deduction. So you have zero tax due and you get a deduction. So quite often when somebody has an appreciated asset, we tell them don't sell it and give that to charity. Mm -hmm. give the asset to charity. Now, I actually went online to my where I trade and uh, I'm sure most of the brokerage houses are like this. It's very easy to do this. Uh, the one I use, it had a page for donating to a charity and mm -hmm. you go in and say, I want to donate who the charity is and what their account number is and so forth. I've done it. And as long as they have a brokerage account, the 501c3, Pretty easy to do. Yeah, we had to do that um, on some stock that forgot that we'd had and it ran up. We'd had it for close to 20 years, had almost no basis in it. It was the same situation. You're just like, do I really want to pay tax on this? I'm going to, I'm going to dump it. It was, at, it was, at, it was peaking. And I said, ah, you know what, let's sell it. 
um, but I don't really want to pay tax on it. I don't want the money. So give it to the charity in order for the charity to take it. The charity had to open up a brokerage account with the same institution. And then we just transferred it over. It was actually fairly, fairly easy to do the transfer. The hardest part was opening up the brokerage account in the, in the nonprofit. It's a little bit of paperwork. So they're, they're talking, they mentioned stock options. Yeah. Uh, I can't see it doing it for options that you purchase on the market. Uh, if it's options that you've got from an employer that may be a little different. Well, it's funny you say that. So whenever I see options, I always think if it's an employee uh, incentive, so incentive stock option, and then you have, uh, what is it? Non- Non-qualified options. Non-qualified. Then there's your typical qualified options, which is US companies, but the non-qualified, if it's an employee, it all comes down to, what is the value when you receive it and did the employee exercise it? And is there transfer rights? So let's say that I have an incentive stock option. If I work at an employer long enough, so let's say I, let's say I work at ABC and I'm an executive and I have, uh, the company is, is on the public market and it's worth 25 bucks and I have options at 25 bucks, but I can't exercise them for what, two or three years, I have to stay employed. So let's say that the company is now worth 50 bucks. And I know that if I were to exercise it, that I have a taxable event because mm -hmm. the option is worth less than the fair market value. I would have to recognize that difference in income. And so, so I think maybe I'll give it to charity so that when I worked long enough, I will be able to exercise it and not have to worry about the tax hit. Uh, because if the company goes up to a hundred bucks, it would be really severe on me to exercise that stock option. I'm going to have a lot of, of income. You can't do that, right? You're not, you're not allowed to do that because you are now putting your work into the corp, into the nonprofit. In other words, I, I'm not going to be able to do that because it's not something that's ripe yet. I need to ha have the ability to exercise it in order for it to actually be doable. Even on the non-qualified options, it's tough. If it's tied to an employee uh, agreement, again, what you're looking at is, let's say that same scenario, it's worth 50 bucks. I had the option at 25. I have income between 25 and 50 bucks that I'm going to have to recognize regardless of whether I give it to the charity. I believe under those circumstances, they would say whenever the charity sells it, you have to rec or exercises the option, assuming it's mm -hmm. transferable you're gonna to have to recognize that $15 difference between your strike price and the fair market value when you receive it. So these ISOs, these incentive stock options, um, mm -hmm. let's say that you have exercised those options, you're gonna have a very low cost in those options in particular. Mm -hmm. However, you have to hold them for a year before you can do anything with them. Otherwise, your basis is gonna be like- the, you're, you're gonna, It's gonna be a taxable situation. If I transfer, stock that I've held for less than a year to, into a, uh, to a charity, they're going to treat it just like a cash transfer. So you exercise them, hold them for a year and a day, then transfer them to your nonprofit or wherever it is. Yeah. And then if you, if you do it a year and a day, then it's the fair market value, not the basis. And your deduction is limited to 30% of your adjusted gross income, as mm -hmm. opposed to usually it's 60% or 50%. This year it's cash donations are hundred percent. Right. I think this would be a non-cash I'm doing an option is probably uh, 60%, but you know, does that sound confusing by the way? This is why you look at the type of option, what, what you know, it, it's not as easy as saying, hey, can I transfer option? But let's say that I have leaps. Let's say that I bought two year options on Tesla and they go up in value. That I could transfer to charity. That if I've held it over a year it would be its fair market value on the data transfer. If I haven't owned it for a year, then I could transfer that in there, but it's my basis. So if I paid $30,000 for some options and it's worth 40, I'm getting a $30,000 deduction. If I waited a year and it's worth 40,000, I get a $40,000 deduction. My only limitation is it's 30% of my adjusted gross income. Let's say they're not leaps, that they are short term. Mm -hmm. Do you think they would have to be so far deep into the money that I think you're still less than a year. So they're going to treat it as a non, 
It'll be a oh, non- that's true. Yeah, so it's going to still be. So good point. Uh, all of these, this, this whole appreciated stock thing, it, it, it has to be long term capital gains. Yeah, it, in, in the first year, it's all going to be um, your basis, regardless. When it's over a year, then it's the fair market value. And by the way, this works on houses and other things too. So if you have a, a piece of property you've had for 20 years or 30 years, and you're like, oh, I've depreciated it. I don't know what to do with it. Sometimes just give it to charity. Your own charity is great or somebody else's, but it's going to be the fair market value. Mm-hmm. And yes, it's limited to 30% of your adjusted gross income, but some of you guys make a lot of money. Like somebody's making a million bucks a year and they're sitting on some old house and looking at it. It's like, yeah, if you're in California, you're going to get about, you know, almost 50 cents on the dollar just for the, just for the gift. And you're going to make somebody's day. All right. Uh, if you like this sort of stuff, you can always come to our tax and asset protection workshops. You just go to our website at Anderson Advisors. You can sign up. They're absolutely free. The next tax and asset protection event is coming up on April 24th. It's going to be taught by myself and Clint Coons. Assuming Clint can get his computer to work in Hawaii. He's going to be over there probably drinking too much. Uh, and we always do the tax and asset protection events. Actually, he'll, he'll be fine. I'll be early in the morning for him. So. I don't think I have to worry about him. If it was in the afternoon, I'd be worried because he likes those Mai Tais, right? Um, So anyway, so we'll be teaching another one April 24th. Again, absolutely free. Feel free to register. Uh, We do send out a recording if you're not able to be there for the whole thing. Uh, We always make sure that it's easy for you to get on, digest the information, and they are full of everything from how to structure your real estate, your stock trading, your business, We look at it from an asset protection standpoint, and we look at it from a tax standpoint, we look at it from a legacy planning standpoint. Last but not least, we look at it from a business standpoint, making sure that you don't mess yourself up. All right, see if there's any questions rolling out there. Where do I find a good bank for my solo 401k? I think Christos is answering that. I would say go to to Schwab is where we open up most of ours or TD Ameritrade. Uh, Let's see. Does it matter if we're taking uh... Uh, hard assets into the 401k? Not really. Like if I was taking real estate or something, it doesn't matter. I, I, I'm okay having a Schwab account with check writing and, and debit card capabilities. It's better than a bank in my mind. Right now, uh, savings is the interest rates are so low. Money markets are, are low, but they're a little bit better. <laughs> if we're talking about those, like they're, they're in the toilet. Every, every All interest rates are in the toilet right now. They probably will be. Uh, to, 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 let's see if there's anything else. No, you guys are pretty good. Schwab bought uh, TD Ameritrade. Yep. Schwab, TD Ameritrade's, uh, where where we have, uh, I think Thinkorswim is in that same category. Um, some places are tough because they want to have minimums. And so if you're rolling over a 401k or you're starting a 401k, it's kind of tough if you haven't funded it yet. And they say the minimum of 50 grand is sometimes tough. All right, solar credit. How do you claim a solar credit on your personal residence? This is fairly simple. Uh, it's done, I believe the form is 56.95. Look right there. Wow. Yeah, I got it right. Um, and good. you can see in the first couple of lines, it talks about the different types of renewable mm-hmm. energy. You put your solar, mm-hmm. amount of solar that you bought uh, it multiplies at times 0.26 and you're virtually done. Yep. And you say 0.26, it, w- it was 30% from 2017, 2018, 2019, went to 26%, actually it was going to go down to 22% this year, but they extended it. So it's 26% and it's the cost of the install and the equipment itself. It's solar power, geothermal heat pumps. I'm looking at a list, small wind turbines, fuel cell property, solar electric collecting roofs and roof products, solar power storage, some installation in the in, in, in costs. And this is different than if you were a landlord putting it on your property, although they're the same tax credit. What's the difference between a tax credit and a deduction? A uh, deduction goes against your income. So if it's a $20,000 deduction, you have 100,000 income, blows your income down to 80,000. A credit goes against your tax. So if that same dollar for dollar, if that same hundred thousand dollar income has uh, mm-hmm. twenty thousand dollars of tax on it, then that credit 
is going to go directly against that tax to reduce your tax. Yeah. So if I have a hundred thousand dollars of income and I get a ten thousand dollar deduction, it just means that I'm going to pay tax on ninety thousand. If I have a ten thousand dollar tax credit, then we take that hundred, we calculate how much tax. Let's say I owe fifteen thousand dollars of tax at the end of the day, and I get a ten thousand dollar credit, so I'd only owe five thousand dollars after that. So credits worth substantially more than a tax deduction. Mm -hmm. So when you see tax credit, go like this, how do I get it? How do I get that? And uh, yeah, the same thing holds true for if you're a landlord, uh, it's a different code provision, I think it's 48, uh, but the provision there, you still get a 26% tax credit, but you could also depreciate the fair market value minus half of the tax credit that you took. So if you took a Let's say, let's say we put $100,000 worth of solar on our, on our tenant roofs and we're going to lease, we're going to get the electricity uh, money coming in too, which is not a bad idea. We'd get a $26,000 tax credit plus we'd get to write off $87,000 and under section 168K, which is the bonus depreciation code section, we could just write that whole thing off in year one, like boom, I have an $87,000 deduction. I have a $26,000 tax credit and I might be paying over time, but I have enough money coming in to cover that payment. I'm going to be, I'm going to be uh, looking, looking pretty, pretty good under that. I'm always surprised that more people don't do that. I, I'm a little surprised that I have not heard anything about them increasing this credit. I keep thinking they're going to do it. I keep I waiting for it. And I'm way. like, like, if you want, Solar, here's what you do with solar. Hey, you make it to where we can actually put it up on the roof without getting molested by the, the, uh, the governing agencies, right? It's tough. If you're in California, you might be waiting a, a year or two years to get solar on a roof, right? If, uh, in so, so make it easier. Make it uh, a little more transparent. There's a lot of companies out there. You know, make mm -hmm. sure that consumers aren't getting ripped. I see Tesla's doing it now. Tesla is kicking some, some, some tush. And by the way, if you had a Tesla roof and you were in Houston during that freeze, you were just fine. Like they, they actually showed the rooftops and yeah, the didn't stay up on the, on those roofs. They melted right off and uh, they were, they were providing energy throughout that whole rigmarole. So Tesla's pretty cool. It comes with the battery pack, the storage, so you can, you could store it up and survive for a, a while without even having the solar. Um, but yeah, I would, I would give more incentives. If you want more of something, incentivize it. So the tax credit's great, but make it a little more juicy. So, so landlords go out and do it. Could you imagine that if they made it so appealing to landlords that like landlords are like, you're, you're crazy not to put so solar on your property. Right. But then you have to deal with all the utilities, going back to the utilities again, and the way that they treat it, whether you could sell it back. Uh, can foreign property treat it as US property, get the solar credit? Foreign property treated as US property. If it's in the US, and it's U.S. taxpayers, you get the solar credit. I don't believe it works if it's outside the... Yeah, if you're meaning foreign-owned property, um, yeah. yeah, you should be getting the credit. So let's say that you have it in another country. You believe you're able to get the I credit? I don't believe that's the case. Right, right. So if it's U.S. I think it's U.S., but I'm not, I don't know. I have to look at it. Good question. And you could submit your questions at Tax Tuesday at Anderson Advisors. Uh and you could uh, you could just submit that in. I'll give us uh, the hint to go search it up. Uh, Bill Meyer waited 130, 1131 days to get solar. Did he actually get it? Last time I, I heard he was still waiting. Uh, <laughs> I'm opening an UGMA for my children, 10, 11, and 13. What are the tax consequences? Okay, we'll look at that one in a second. There's, somebody's gonna answer that. All right, this is a great question. Should I file a return with my kids as dependents or should they file their own return if they're paid from a family business? What do you think, Jeff? I know my opinion on this is if they are dependents, meaning they are not supporting themselves or at least have mm -hmm. their support, uh, they're still dependent on your return. Now they can file their own return and probably have to file their own return. And they still get the standard deduction. They get the standard deduction up to the amount of their earned income. Is I think, it, what is it, six hundred dollars? It's earned, earned income plus three hundred dollars. Okay. So if they, so if you pay your children five thousand bucks, then it's five thousand three hundred 
up to the standard deduction. Standard deduction is what, 12,400 mm -hmm. this year, 12,200 last year. It's over 12 grand. So it would, they're not gonna pay any tax on it. This is why we pay our kids, guys. They're still a dependent, but they get to have tax-free income. And where would you put that? Riddle me this, they have income that they don't have to pay tax on. It's active income. Where should you put it, parents? A Roth IRA. I'll just do <laughs> You're like looking over here at heat pumps. I can see you. You're going to put it in a Roth IRA. That's exactly right. Under the mattress. Don't put it under the mattress. You want to put it in a Roth IRA. And the reason being is because you can get the money out at any time you want with, I know, Ruin. I'm just teasing you. She says under the mattress. And I, I'll tell you a real life story. I have a minister uh, client. And they went to a, an older gentleman of their church had passed away and they went to help the family. It was like grandpa lived on his own. They went to help the family clean out the house and the, 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 the family said, you could just take it all to charity, take it all, all the furniture and everything else. So they go get his mattress and the mattress weighs a ton. And they're like, what the heck? This thing's so heavy. And then they hear clinking. It was stuffed with cash and gold and silver. And so they just had a huge party. Oh, no, I'm just kidding. I, I, I said to him, so did you think, did, did it go through your head that they gave it to you or did you think? No, he was like, no, 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 no. This guy had a, he, he just stuffed everything in there. It was, it was about 300,000, if I remember right, of, uh, of, of, of gold and, <laughs> and cash. So if you ever have an older relative that passes, look through the refrigerators. Here's a hint. Look through the house a little bit. <laughs> Some people, they do keep it under the mattress. Some people like it in the freezer. A lot. The freezer's a big one. Uh, under, there's there's been people that had it underneath the floorboards. We've seen it all. Uh, but but they put it in, in, in odd places and people will never know. We had a guy that had a, a safe full, had over a million bucks in it. Yep. That's not what the mattress fence says. There's no inflation. Yeah, why not? Yeah, so you don't, yes. Um, the Fed says there's no inflation. Oh. Well, it wasn't a oh. bad mattress. So oh, no the Fed. Don't fight the Fed. Um, yeah, somebody says uh, Bill Meyer got it approved, got it in. Good. I know that he was griping about that for a long time, but it was, it was a little tough. And you got to have three or four guys come out there. Remember that. They look at your, at your proposal. All right. So you can file your kids as dependents and they, they pay earned income. There's no kitty tax when you have earned income. How old can they be? Somebody asked. Uh, there's, there's cases where uh, the, the court has uh, agreed with compensation paid to seven-year-olds that were helping their parents with property management. So it's not an age issue if they're your children. If I remember right, you can't have your kids working in mining around saws, doing demolition work, doing things that are inherently dangerous, but you can have them working in your business if they're family members and there's no age limitation. In the court cases, I've seen seven-year-olds, nine-year-olds, 11-year-olds, 12-year-olds, 13-year-olds, and every single time it comes down to, are they able to do the task in which they're being compensated for? And so uh, in every single one of them that I've seen, the taxpayer won, like the IRS was looking at it and they overcame the, the burden by, by, by producing records. So you just wanna make sure you have some timesheets or something that says, here's what they're doing. Um, and if you do that, you put it in a Roth IRA and the Roth IRA is like a savings plan. I can always take that money back out of the Roth. Where I have to be careful is let's say I put $5,000 in a Roth and it doubles. The growth is what I have to wait a period of years for, five years, um, to avoid the penalties on, on early withdrawal. <clears throat> Somebody says, what's the minimum age again? Again, we've seen it as low as seven. There's not a hard and fast rule. Just make sure they can do something. And if you're going to open up a Roth IRA, understand that they cannot, cannot open their own until they are 18. So you're going to have to open up a custodial IRA for them. All right. Oh, there's infinity. Yay. And this is what I like to circle. So we were number one in new releases today. Thank you again. We did, uh, we're doing well with that one. 
uh, what we like to do is just spread the word. It's not a big money maker. Um, there are publishers out there that like we publish through Forbes, but we're not trying to sell millions. We just try to get the, the word out of how not to get ripped off. Uh, somebody says, I had a friend who paid his one-year-old. He took a picture, paid it as a model. Yeah, th there's actually a case on that where, uh, where it was SAG rates, the Screen Actors Guild rates, so they can actually get paid. So that's pretty awesome. David, thank you for sharing that. Uh, is the solar credit only for brand new solar products? I don't believe so. I think it's any uh, sell, sell, sell solar that you put up on your roof. I don't think yeah, they but have. That would, uh, wouldn't that be all brand new? I, is there used solar? I've never heard of used solar. Yeah, I don't know. So if you're talking about buying a house that already has solar on it, you don't get the credit for that. Somebody asks, please clarify, kids do not need to file returns, correct? Even if they are paid $12,000. You don't have to file a return if you don't have taxes owed, right? Correct. So they wouldn't have to file a return under those circumstances. All right. Can you describe, did I just skip over one? Yes. Oh, yeah. Right. I have rental property in California. When I go there to work on it, I can use per diem plus mileage rather than actual receipts for housing and meals. Jeffrey. Uh, this is going to be one of those, it depends answer. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're doing it through as a um, self-employed person or uh, you have the rentals owned personally, you cannot use the per diem for housing. You mm -hmm. can use it for meals, uh, but you have to be an employee to use per diem. Yeah. So I think it's, what is it? If more than 10%, no housing. Mm-hmm. So if you own more than 10% of the company, they're going to say, hey, you're an owner. You can't use the per diem for uh, housing. But for meals, you can. And one of the reasons you can is because I think it's capped at about $75 a day. And technically, you don't have to have a uh, receipt for meals if it's under 75 bucks a day. So uh, it is still subject to the 50% limitation. Unless. Less. There's 100% uh, meal depreciation that just came out at the end of the year for using restaurants. And even if you order out mm -hmm. at a restaurant. So it's temporary. It's under the, uh, it was past the last week of December. So you guys are all dealing with 2020. Right. So for 2021, there is an exception for this year that you can write off 100% of meals uh, as long as it's at a restaurant. So they're trying to push it. Uh, and per diem works a little funny. Uh, the way it works is, say it's let's say it's eighty dollars. I know mm -hmm. you said seventy five dollars, but it's eighty dollars a day for meals. Uh, on your first day of travel, you only get half that. On your last day of half travel, you only get half that. Oh, boo! So if it, you're doing a three day trip, you're going to get what eighty hundred and sixty dollars of meals. Mm -hmm. Yes. Sorry, right. somebody's asking a question about the kids again. Uh, what is the age limit to pay your child up to 25 year olds? There is no limit. You could be paying a child if they're, if they're working for your company until they're 150. Uh, do you have to pay it run payroll? And somebody's asking about self-employment tax. So if you're running if you're paying them as an employee, if you're paying them through a corporation, you're going to have unemployment and, and withholding and, and, and social security and Medicare withholdings and employment taxes. If you pay them through, a disregarded LLC, or if, if one of the parents uh, has a sole proprietorship, or if, if the parents have a partnership and you pay them through there, then you do not have to pay employment taxes. So if there is a partnership in your structure, you'd pay them through the partnership. If there is an LLC that's disregarded, you pay them through that. If you don't have those and you pay them through the corporation, you pay a little bit of tax, but just keep in mind, that you're putting that money into their social security account. Like they're gonna get some of that back, assuming that social security makes it, they would still get that. Um, let's keep plugging along. Can you describe S corporation non-taxable distributions or dividends? So S corps don't have dividends. They don't pay dividends. They pay distributions. Um, and those are normally not taxed because you're being taxed on the income of the S corporation. You pay regardless. 
So let's say I make $100,000 in my S corporation. That's going to be my taxable income, regardless of how much gets distributed to me. Mm -hmm. Now, the one time you will have distributions taxable is if you distribute more than you have basis in your S corporation. Mm -hmm. uh, and then it gets taxed as capital gains. That'd be really tough to do. I guess if 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 I if you had multiple S corp owners, and somebody wasn't at risk. Yeah, sometimes we see it where uh, they'll have an S corporation. They'll go out and get a loan, mm -hmm. and they'll start taking distributions. Well, that loan they got from the bank doesn't give them basis to their S corporation unless it's a loan to them, and then they've contributed. Yes. Then then you could increase the basis. It's one of those nuances that if you're ever looking at getting lending with an S corp. You may want to be on the hook personally like it has to come to you and then you could contribute it to the s corp it's like a weird nuance you can't the s corp can't have it and you guarantee it and still be part of basis yeah almost the exact opposite is true in a partnership yep uh but with s corporation they want you to be the the lender mm -hmm. it's kind of funky so what jeff said is is just to clarify s corporations they don't pay tax, they pass it down to their shareholders, regardless of whether you take distributions or not. So that's why they say non-taxable distributions. What happens is if the company makes $100,000 and leaves it in there, it doesn't matter, you're gonna pay tax on the 100,000 if you're the sole owner. Same thing is the next year, let's say it breaks even and you take 100,000 out, you think, I just took 100,000 out, it's non-taxable. No, you paid the tax, you just paid it in the last year. And sometimes we hear that complaint about phantom income mm -hmm. and that's exactly what they're talking about. My company made a lot of money, but I didn't see a dime of it personally. Well, think about this. If it, Let's say that you are running a company and you have a whole bunch of meals um, that are 50%. So let's just say that you're bringing in meals to the office and mm -hmm. stuff like that. And it's 50% deductible. So you spent $30,000 during the year and there's no money left in it. And you, you're going to get hit with 15,000, half of that as income to you and you're going to say wait a second but there's no money you know the, your accountant's going to say half deductible you know you were really nice to your employees but that pizza ain't free right you got to pay the piper all right uh let's see if there's any questions rolling around there somebody says i received my copy of infinity investing let me know how you like it please and uh, don't pull punches it took a couple years to write that and four years of doing the research and preparing for it. So it wasn't done on a whim. I just want to make sure that we're reaching people and share it if, if you think it's good. Uh, la, 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 la. Uh, if you have a short-term rental property that you furnished and ran a cost segregation study on and rent it out, and then you decided a year or two later that you want to move into the property, is there a timeline and how long you can wait to move in or make it your personal residence? Not really, is there? No, I don't think so. No. You just accelerated depreciation. You just got to be careful about when you sell it, if you sell it. Yeah, and, you have a really low basis in that property. And, and just remember that if, that if you live in it for two years and then sell it and you take a capital gain exclusion, that capital, capital gain exclusion does not touch your, uh, your unrecaptured depreciation or your recaptured depreciation. Yeah, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. Whatever we call it. We just <laughs> had that argument last week. Your recapture, you're going to have a, you're going to have, you're, it's not going to affect your recapture. Uh, the, peer, the per diem meal for 2020, are there any limitations on the number of days? No. Mm -mm. All right, follow us on social media. You got Facebook, YouTube, LinkedIn, Instagram, Twitter. Please uh, plug in and uh, we're constantly putting out new information. If you go into the YouTube, for example, you're going to see Coffee with Carl and Tony Talks and a lot of stuff's from Clint, a lot of stuff from me. Uh, you can do all that fun stuff uh, and you're constantly going to get hit and then you'll be old hand at this and everybody's going to be asking you tax questions and business questions in about two or three years. All your friends will be like, all right, what should I do in this situation? And then you're going to say, I don't want to talk to you. you can call these guys. No, I'm just teasing you guys will be an answer at all it's not rocket science this is not the hardest stuff on the planet this is actually once you see it it starts to make sense uh i haven't done taxes for 2020 and i'd like to know how to write off bills for my emotional support animal 
Uh, can that be done together with business taxes? What say you, Jeff? Uh, that's a maybe. Uh, and it's going to really depend on what IRS and the courts have primarily looked at. There's, there's two primary tests you have. That's the primarily for test and the but for test. That is really good that you remember that. Uh, the primarily for test says that this, these expenses for any kind of medical expense is primarily for to deal with a condition, medical, psychiatric, uh, mental, so forth. Either, either correcting a, a, something or treating something. It can't be for, I'm sad, right? It has to be a medical condition. Yes. So there needs to be a diagnosis. Let's say it's depression. And then it's primary for the depression, right? The second test, the but for test is, I would not have bought this. I would not have spent this money, but for this condition. Correct. Um, so you can't take your pet dog and turn it into an emotional support dog. It's going to fail every time. Um, so the, Go ahead. So there, there are a few ways to go about this. Uh, number one, get it prescribed by your doctor. Number two, hopefully this animal and what it's, how it's treating you is on the ADA list, mm -hmm. uh, the Americans with Disabilities Act list. If it's prescribed, you're probably going to be hitting that. Yeah. Uh, and, and the courts are going to want to know how, what this animal is doing for you. Mm -hmm. uh, it just living with you is usually not the answer. Uh, it's either got to be treating something. It, it, it's got to be trained to do something in particular. It needs to actually be a certified animal. Like, right. right. So you actually have to make it. It has to be when you say emotional support animal, some places would give you a certificate if you just said, oh, it's an emotional support animal, but it's the IRS is actually gonna want a certification that it was trained for this particular issue that it's helping you with. So for example, if it's a post-traumatic stress disorder and you were a, a service member or somebody that was a, a first responder and there's issues, then uh, the emotional support animal needs to be trained for that particular right. reason. And that the reason that you're getting the support animal is because of that condition, but for, this condition, I wouldn't be getting the uh, the support animal. And then it becomes a medical expense. And the reason this is important is because if I'm an individual, I'm putting that medical expense on my Schedule A, mm -hmm. and I have to exceed over seven and a half percent of my adjusted gross income. If I have a C corporation, I can reimburse. Or if I have a FSA or HSA uh, uh, health savings account, then I can reimburse directly out of that. So some of you guys, I know this is the scenario because I've seen this. Somebody goes out and they're paying for something individually. It's a medical expense, but they can't write it off because they don't exceed their adjusted gross income. Whereas they might've been able to do it if they had done an HSA, take the deduction and then reimburse yourself out of the HSA or, or, or uh, uh, flexible savings. So like these C&I dogs, they're mm -hmm. professionally trained. I think they cost about 50,000. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a big write-off for you. You're gonna be guaranteed schedule A, but there's nothing that says you can't self-train these animals to do what you need them to do, whether it's, uh, I've seen them for preventing uh, uh, certain behaviors and things Epilepsy, like that. there's one, there's uh, uh, obviously depression and uh, PTSD. They'll, they'll understand when you start, it's like a pheromone or something. They can actually mm -hmm. sense it or smell it. So yeah, if you're doing the training yourself, your costs are likely to be much lower. I, I still think you want to do it through some kind of certification program. Mm -hmm. uh, just to help you out. Uh, emotional support animals, unfortunately, have gotten a very bad name by some very bad actors uh, who just, oh, but, but, you just want to take their poodle into the diner. Well, that, and that's what some of the states said, is that they couldn't ask you whether it's an emotional support animal. And so people were abusing it left and right because you weren't allowed to question them because in theory, there's HIPAA and there's some other things about what they can ask you about. And, so they would say, hey, like an airline can't ask you. So eventually they just said, only dogs, right? A uh, friend of mine is a flight attendant and showed me pictures of somebody's emotional support chickens. Yeah, I was going to say, I've, I've heard about stuff like that, where they had a goose and they had chickens. And... Uh, but yeah, it, <laughs> it's obvious that, that these emotional support animals, true emotional support animals, are very helpful to people who need them just to get through their day. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you do it the right way, you can get a deduction for them. Yep. 
And so you you want to be talking to your, your accountant. And so going back to this question, you could still look and see what you did in 2020 on the on the on the emotional support animal C. And I, I believe it has to be a it says animal, but I believe it has to be a dog. Uh, don't quote me on that, but I believe that there might be some restrictions on certain things. It's like, mm -hmm. again, they don't want it to be your emotional support cat. I, there was an emotional support cat that case that went through. Really? Yeah. It's another fun one where, uh, again, talk to your accountant and it might be worth digging into depending on the cost, how much you incurred. But you have cats. You know they really don't care about people. If you want emotional support, don't get a cat. <laughs> you want to be, if you want to be ignored. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, I'm, I'm only going to pay attention when you don't want me to. <laughs> yeah. Unless you have friends over or if you have a Zoom meeting, in which case that's a good time for them to groom themselves <laughs> in full view of everybody. I'm like, look at me. <laughs> That's a that's a cat. Or if they have a hairball, they always wait until you're eating dinner, or you're about to go to bed. Um, I love my kitties. They're just naughty as all get out, and they are fluffy right now. All right, uh, let me see if there's any other questions. How can you claim the solar panel credit as a landlord? You're going to write it off as a as an equipment deduction, but you're going to take the um, the solar credit. I don't know if there's an actual form that you have to do as a as a landlord, I'm trying to think of where you put it on your return. There is a form for the credit, and of course, the depreciation is going to go on the depreciation mm -hmm. form. Um, but uh, I, I would think the most difficult thing with the landlord uh, is just the accounting for it on their books. Yep, it gets a little weird. And just remember, you can't write off like the the installation, everything that goes into it. You get to deduct, but you have to subtract from your your basis that you're deducting half of the credit that you take. So they're gonna look at the tax credit and if it's, let's say it's $20,000, you're only you're gonna to have to take $10,000 off, uh, off the basis. All right, enough of that. Subscribe to Anderson's YouTube channel, please. Go again, there's Coffee with Carl, there's Clint, looking all stately, giving out good advice. There's just so much stuff that's out there. And if you like listening to the Tax Tuesdays or watching the Tax Tuesday, by all means, you can go to our podcast and we record them and we put them out there as well as a bunch of others. I've had some really cool folks on the podcast, by the way, uh, some great uh, on, on two different occasions. I've had some great uh, wholesalers that are in the seven figure plus a year range that are really doing a good job at it. And I just think it's kind of fun. I also had a good one that I would ask you guys to go take a look at. I had a, a friend of mine, Lars Jacobson, who is up on the border between uh, 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 Idaho and Canada, where they shut down the, the Canadian border. And he runs a restaurant, a gas station, and a mail stop that is primarily serviced, uh, or uh, the, the patrons are primarily from Canada. About 95% of the folks are right there. Like it's like the town has, a, has the, the border right in the middle of it. Here's all of his restaurants and all these things. And then on the other side of it is all the the town and since the uh, pandemic they've been shut down and so he's lost 95 percent of his uh revenue did a uh, did a podcast there there's been some new stations that have come out and talked because the 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 programs that were designed by congress haven't haven't really done much for him and so uh if, if you're interested there's 10 10 members of the family all working up there he moved his entire family from california years ago to go uh, basically see this vision of brought his mom and his relatives and all of his kids and they're up there and they're running this it's it's basically they bought this little town for, for lack of a better word right on the border and uh yeah there's a lot of folks that have been hit by this pandemic but i did a really neat one there if you if you care to go look at that uh and if you're able to spare a dollar or two to to help him out and his family uh, they've been really, it's really been tough uh, for them, but I'm sure they'll make it. They have good faith too. Uh, you can also go in and, and uh, uh, listen to the previous Tax Tuesdays in your Platinum portal if you're already Platinum. If you're not Platinum, by all means, find out how you become Platinum. Uh, we have a ton of different programs uh, to where there's ordinarily a sign-up fee. And depending on the program you do, you can get away from those sign-up fees if you're getting other services. So you can always look and see whether or not that's appropriate. If you have questions, and uh, again, you can always submit your questions at taxtuesdayandersonadvisors.com. There's not a cost to it. We don't have a surprise bill for you. And we do grab those questions 
and make them part of our our, our, uh, our shows when we go over and we answer those questions. So that's why I always grab them. So I always enjoy really good, thoughtful questions. Don't write me a, a novel, but something that we could put up as a simple question of one or two liners that will help other people. So even if it's something that you're like, I've always been wondering this, go ahead and submit it. And uh, we'll see if we can answer it for everybody. Uh, we may as well get uh, 700 at a shot. You know, there's a few thousand people that listen to this. So we can answer it for a lot of other people because chances are, if you're thinking it, other people are probably thinking of it too. Otherwise, that's it. We're done early. Okay, not wow. necessarily early, early, but pet, like, look at this. Patty's always yelling at me. Um, I'm not going to know what to do. I know. That's <laughs> awesome. And thanks. All right, guys. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn off the uh, tax Tuesday, with the exception of if you have questions, our guys will continue to bust through your questions. I can see that we've answered over 116 questions. There's 15 remaining open. So we'll go ahead and knock those out. I just want to say thanks, guys, for joining us. And we will see you in two weeks at the next Tax Tuesday. Till next time. Until next time. That's right.